helping me uh, present our work here. Um, it it's makes my life easier to go after Brittany and uh, Ritu because they have given most of the introductions. So I'm going to skip most of it. And it's also a challenge to go after them, and you'll find out why. Because the sample numbers that I'm going to be talking about is minuscule compared to what they're having in their studies. And that's solely because uh, what I do in my lab, what we do in my lab is our hypothesis is that metabolism is one of the drivers of cancer. Uh, and reprogrammed metabolism is what is one of the factors that could be involved in uh, cancer progression. So uh, my lab works both on breast cancer and prostate cancer health disparity. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to be showing you some data that we uh, in the area of breast cancer to begin with. And then I'll go into some in the area of prostate cancer and then end with a study that we published in the area of pan cancer. So, uh, disclosures, my lab is uh, designated as the Agilent Center for Mass Spectrometry uh, Excellence, uh, and are, there are four centers over there uh, around the world, and so I get funding from Agilent uh, Technologies, both in terms of uh, money, monetary uh, funds for the lab, as well as mass spectrometers that they um, provide uh, for us uh, uh, every two years. So. Um, so my metabolic capabilities, so just before I start my work, start my uh, talk, I was just going to, I'm going to just introduce you to what we do in the lab. Uh, this is basically metabolism, the metabolic one, the biochemistry 101 that all of you have studied. And we basically are able to measure each one of these metabolites in uh, biological specimens uh, using mass spectrometry. To give you a highlight, our lab can look at over 600 metabolites. We do unbiased metabolomic analysis, unbiased lipidomic analysis. We do 13C flux analysis where we are able to quantify the pathway activity both both in vitro and more recently we're developing in vivo where we can inject C13 glucose into mice, C13 glutamine into mice and we can track the uh, activity of the pathway in vivo. Uh, and we also do what we call as metabolic phenotyping microarrays where we can identify metabolic dependencies and most importantly we do integration of omic data sets. And this is going to be the example that I'm going to talk, talk, talk to you about uh, in a short while. Uh, this is just giving you how we do the metabolic flux, something that we have just developed where we basically inject tumor cells into the mice. We have a control and a test condition and then after these tumors have grown we can basically label these using a jugular weight injection of C13 glutamine that is infused into the mice. We also do this now using a modified feed that we have just come up with where we can feed the mice with C13 glutamine containing feed or C13 glucose containing feed and we can then collect the tumor samples to LCMS analysis and what we can really tell is how the metabolite is getting incorporated into the different pathways. So we can utilize all these samples, uh, all mouse and human samples, uh, including all tissues and non-invasive fluids for our metabolic analysis. So that gives you a kind of a brief outline of where our lab, what our lab does. So these are some of the publications that we have contributed to in the, in the context of uh, metabolism and cancer uh, uh, with various groups. And these are some of our publications in the context of prostate cancer. So going to today's study, the first example was a study that was done in collaboration with one of my close colleagues, Stefan Ams, from the National Cancer Institute. This was, we had two JCA papers that came out of this. That's Stefan out there. And the, the, the finding, the, the, the first paper was uh, titled MIG Driven Accumulation of this Metabolite 2-Hydroxyglutrate in uh, uh, Breast Cancer. So the study design, this was a study where uh, Stefan had collected samples uh, of breast cancer tissues. He had both uh, breast tumors and adjacent normal, uh, which are basically adjacent non-tumor tissues, about 67 patients that were classified as ER positive or ER negative histologically. Uh, he also had them uh, typed as African American and European American. So in this case, the patients that we call African American are not self-reported, they're ancestry types. So they're really, uh, we know that the, they're uh, typed by their ancestry information markers. We also had a validation sets. The important thing about this study is that from every tissue that we collected from the patient, we had matched data sets for genome-wide DNA, uh, uh, DNA methylation analysis, gene expression analysis, proteomic analysis, untargeted metabolic analysis, and targeted metabolic analysis. So we, we had matched data sets for each tumor for all these patients. So this is basically giving you an overview of the first uh, metabolic analysis. 298 metabolites distributed against all the, all, all the tissue, uh, all the samples. Red, the shades of red indicate elevated levels of metabolite. Shades of blue indicate down-regulated levels of metabolite. And here again, we have, we have basically uh, arranged them based on the race here. You have the African-American tumors, European-American tumors, and the corresponding adjacent benign. And the moment you start looking at it, the bird's eye view, you can tell that there's a lot of metabolic alteration happening in the tumors, and more so in African-American tumors than in European-American tumors. Thank you. 
Again, a snapshot when we start looking only between the ER negative tumors. Again, the green bars here are African Americans. The yellow bar here is European Americans. Again, you can clearly see that there is clear metabolic alteration happening in African American ER negatives, and so does so in the case of triple negative breast cancers. So, uh, cutting to the chase, when we looked at the total metabolic profile, one of the things that really stood up was this metabolite 2-hydroxyglutric acid. And the reason we it came to our attention was because around this time when we were doing this, uh, this study was being performed, this 2-hydroxyglutrate uh, was a hot molecule, still a hot molecule context of glioblastoma, where people show the neomorphic uh, mutations of IDH, leads to accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutrate. It was interesting to see that the same 2-hydroxyglutrate was high in, Af in tumors in general, but more importantly, a subset of African-American tumors had higher levels of 2-hydroxyglutrate compared to European-American tumors. So what, is, uh, what was known at that time, it was known that 2-hydroxyglutrate accumulates in glioblastoma, a glioma in, uh, it, because of uh, neomorphic mutations of IDH, it increases DNA methylation and decreases 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in the DNA, and this is basically caused because it disrupts the function of this demethylase called TET1 and TET2. At that point of time, the role of this particular metabolite in breast cancer was unknown. So I told you that we had matched data sets. And because there was a data out there saying that 2-hydroxyglutrate does affect the methylation profile, our first approach was to divide up the breast cancer patients based on the DNA methylation profile. So when we divide them based on the DNA methylation profile, we get three distinct subsets. We call them subset 1, 2, and 3. And if you look at the distribution, you see that subset 3 contains mostly African-American patients which are more, who are mostly ER negative. Now we take these patients and then we ask the question, what are the metabolic associations present with this subgroup 3? And what really strikes, uh, stands out here is 2-hydroxyglutrate, which is high in subgroup 3 compared to subgroup 2 and subgroup 1. And because this is have, has a role in the methylation, we also went ahead and looked at the uh, uh, methylation pool, which is S-adenosyl homocysteine, S-adenosyl methionine, and there's a clear correlation with patients having high 2-hydroxyglutrate, also having high levels of SAM and SAH in this subgroup 3. So then what we did was we asked this next question, what does this subgroup 3 really mean? And so here we took the gene expression data. So we went to the gene expression compartment. We take the, we take the genes that are now associated with subgroup 3, and we now run it through a Kaplan-Meier analysis because these patients had 10 years of follow-up data. We were able to show that patients who have higher expression of these subgroup 3 genes end up with a poorer prognosis. So these are patients who are pr predominantly African-American, predominantly ER negative, having uh, a specific DNA methylation profile file uh, uh, accumulated levels of 2-hydroxyglutrate and their gene expression signature shows that they have a poor, uh, poor uh, prognosis. We were able to validate this gene expression signature and its prognostic effect across multiple different data sets confirming that patients who have high 2-hydroxyglutrate end up with a signature that is uh, having poor prognosis. So the question then comes, what does this do? What does this 2-hydroxyglutrate do? Or what does this subgroup 3, what is it characterized by? We went back and take, take this gene expression data, we did the gene set enrichment analysis and just like Ritu pointed out, it was interesting to see that the wind signaling was the one that came up as one of the top candidates. And we were able to further show that just by adding 2-hydroxyglutrate to the cells, we were able to modify the methylation profile on the cells. And we were able to create these cells or transform these cells into more uh, uh, EMT-like phenotype uh, over a period of time. And we treated this with 2-hydroxyglutrate, indicating that 2-hydroxyglutrate high samples have something like an EMT-like phenotype that is uh, that is characteristic feature of them. So the next question we asked was, what is it that characterizes this tumor subset? What is it that drives them upstream? So we went back and collected the gene expression data, and we then stratified the tumors based on known signatures. And when I say known signatures, these are clusters of genes that are known to be regulated by various transcription factors. So we tested multiple different transcription factors, and one that really stood up was MEC. And we can see here that when we stratify these patients based on simple, just by their mix signature, we are able to now stratify the subgroup 3 apart from the rest of the subgroup. And so here you have high MIG patients who are predominantly African Americans having a specific DNA methylation signature and high 2-hydroxyglutrate. And these are the patients who are having poorer prognosis as I showed you previously. We were able to go to a cell line model and show that by simply 
uh, knocking down MIC expression or by reinducing MIC expression, we are able to change the levels of 2-hydroxyglutarate in these cell lines. So the question comes, how does MIC do it? So by, for metabolism, we know that MIC regulates glutamine metabolism. One of the major targets of MIC is glutamine metabolism. We went back to our data set and we were able to show that these tumors had very high levels of glutaminase, both at the transcript level as well as at the protein levels shown here in group 3. And in, interestingly enough, when you now take the glutaminase and just do a Kaplan-Meier analysis, you get the opposite plot. So in, in, I, I've shown you that patients with high 2-hydroxyglutarate signature had a poorer prognosis previously. Now I'm showing you that patients with low glutaminase signature uh, or low glutam uh, glutamine, um, uh, glutamine levels, sorry, low glutamine levels have a poorer prognosis, indi potentially indicating that glutamine is being utilized at a higher level in these patients. I'm not going to go into the further data here, but we were able to show that when we infuse C13 glutamine into these cells, they do convert into 2-hydroxyglutarate, indicating that glutamine is a fuel that is required for production of 2-hydroxyglutarate in these patients. So to end this part of the talk, basically what we identified here using this metabolic approach with an integrated biology uh, into that uh, uh, is that we have a subset of patients who are triple negative or ER negative, predominantly African American patients with poorer prognosis who have uh, accumulated levels of 2-hydroxyglutarate and these are patients who are addicted to MIC. And the clinical translation of this comes from the fact that there is glutaminase inhibitors that are out there in the clinical trials. And one of the things that we are trying to ask is can we use 2-hydroxyglutarate in the serum as a prognostic or as an indicator for patients who would be responsive to these glutaminase trials. So the glutaminase trials that are going on, there are a subset of triple negative patients who are responding to this treatment, especially in the context of paclitaxel. But the question that's out there is which other patients would really be responsive to this. And we hope that 2 measurement of 2-hydroxyglutarate levels in the serum of these patients could indicate that these patients could be responsive to glutaminase treatment. So I'm going to quickly switch gears. I guess I have nine minutes. So I'm going to switch gears and tell you something about how what we have done in the area of prostate cancer health disparities. So prostate cancer, just like breast cancer, there is health disparity in African Americans. African American men have more aggressive disease. They have more, more bone metastasis and this, they have poorer clinical outcome uh, for, for the disease compared to the European American men. So again, our hypothesis was basically that there is a metabolic uh, underpinning to this. And so we did, took the uh, we, we basically took African American, again these are all um, uh, what do you call ancestry type African American patients and we're talking about lo localized prostate cancer, that is cancer that is there on the, local, on the, on the, on the prostate. These are uh, androgen dependent tumors, early stage tumors and we basically took the adjacent benign tissue and we did a metabolic profiling and one thing that stood out as I'm showing you here, you can take these metabolites and collapse them into a pathway map and what you would observe at that point is one of the important features is cysteine met methionine metabolism, one carbon metabolism that Dr. Satyamurti was also talking about in the context of diabetes where homocysteine levels were very high in type 2 diabetes. We see the same, same effect in African American cysteine, metabo uh, cysteine methionine metabolism being very high. So what is this metabolic process? It's a very simple process. Methionine goes right to SAM, the methylation currency, and SAM breaks down when it donates a methyl group, breaks down to s arenosyl homocysteine that then stoichiometrically breaks down into homocysteine and adenosine. What I'm going to show you data here is on homocysteine part. I'm not going to show you the data on adenosine due to lack of time. Um, so first thing we did was ask this question, is homocysteine levels elevated in African-American prostate cancer serum? So we have two kinds of patient samples here. First is a case control study that we got from Stephen Ams, which is basically prostate cancer patient and case controls. And you can see that in African-American prostate cancer patients compared to the case controls, there are significantly higher eleva elevated levels of homocysteine in the plasma. And also compared to European-Americans, it was significantly higher. Then we went to the most challenging cohort that a urologist sees in the clinic. These are patients who are basically uh, coming to the clinic with high levels of PSA and where biopsy is the only way they are able to be detected for P prostate cancer. So these are the patients who are going to go to the biopsy table. So we collect these pl plasma from these uh, patients prior to biopsy and then use homocysteine levels to correlate to the biopsy data. And what I'm showing you here is, I'm sorry, is that patients who had positive biopsy had higher levels of homocysteine compared to patients who had negative biopsy. 
and then we went and did a simple analysis because we had um, West African ancestry on these patients. We were able to show that the West African ancestry levels were associated with the levels of homocysteine in these patients with West African ancestry uh, associated with, uh, with an odds ratio of 18.5 for, for homocysteine in these prostate cancer patients. And we also went ahead and we figured out that the reason homocysteine is elevated is because two enzymes in the homocysteine pathway, one is BHMT and the other one is CBS, which are involved in recycling homocysteine either back to methionine or cystathione, was significantly down-regulated in a tissue microanalysis in African Americans compared to European Americans, indicating that homocysteine accumulation is one of the hallmarks of African American prostate cancer, which is what we are currently working on. So this study was published in JNCI Cancer Spectrum, and we are currently trying to characterize the role of homocysteine in the context of bone metastasis in African-American prostate cancer. I'm going to end this talk, the last five minutes. I'm just going to show you one quick study that was basically an in silico study that was done by, uh, my, uh, by uh, my staff scientist and uh, graduate student. And the idea here is, and we have all heard about disparity, we have all heard about African-American patients having poor clinical outcome for majority of the cancers. And so the question we asked is if we take TCGA and stratify all the tumors based on African-Americans and Europe-Americans, what comes up as a common theme that's across all cancers? And uh, this was a study that, that we just published in, JNC, uh, in JCI, and again the idea here is that these two transcription factors were associated with mitochondrial alterations, which was one of the common characteristic features of all African Americans in a pan-cancer setting. Simply speaking, we just took, uh, we, we have taken data, the gene expression data for each of these individual tumor types, stratified them into African and European Americans, and then we did a gene set enrichment analysis and simply asked the question, what are the common pathways that are shared across different tumor types? And when you can see here, oxidative phosphorylation comes up on the top. DNA repair that was spoken today morning in the lung context of lung cancer is the second most enriched uh, theme that comes up in African Americans followed by G2M checkpoint. And we were able to validate that in a small cohort of uh, independent data sets that we downloaded from GEO. Then we ask the question, what are the transcription factors that regulate these pathways? I'm sorry, this is basically showing that when you just look at the gene expression of the mitochondrial genes complex one to complex five, there seems to be definitely more elevated uh, uh, expression of these genes in African Americans. So this, this heat map is comparing the expression of these genes in African Americans compared to European Americans. And then again, if you go back and ask the question, what is the transcription factor that's common across all these patients, all these tumor types in African Americans, you will see that the top, top one is ERR1, which is estrogen-related response factor one, which is a, uh, a, a transcription factor that is known to interact with PGC1 alpha, which is one of the bio, mitochondrial biogenetic mediators. And what we are able to show that in these patients, there seem to be a very good correlation between ERR1 alpha and PGC1 alpha. So this is again in silico, and all we have done here is we have basically gone ahead and done some uh, tissue microanalysis looking at simple mitochondrial numbers using an antibody that we got from mitochondria that stains mitochondria and we are able to show that in many of the tumors African Americans do have uh, higher numbers or higher staining using this mitochondrial antibody compared to European Americans. Again, uh, this just kind of tells you that there is a common theme out there and that common theme uh, seems to be associated with this uh, group of patients who are whom we classify as African Americans compared to European Americans and further studies are definitely required to dwell deeper into this. So with that, I think I'm on time. I would like to end, that's my lab. Uh, uh, my graduate students and my postdocs who helped me do all this work and uh, my collaborators from Michigan, uh, who is uh, uh, is my close collaborator uh, for um, the prostate study. Stefan has been incredible collaborator. He's been an outstanding collaborator for breast study and uh, prostate studies in our lab. Uh, we have collaborators within BCM, and uh, Rick Kittles has helped us do all the ancestry information. Uh, mark, marker analysis, George is our biostatistics uh, an uh, analyst, our uh, expert, and funding from uh, different, different sources that have allowed me to carry on this work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.